Research indicates that betrayal lies at the heart of every failed relationship. This mm. was in your book, The Seven Principles of, of Making Marriage Work. There are a lot of ways to really betray a partner mm. in a relationship. I mean, you know, cheating is one way, but any kind of betrayal is something that needs to be healed in a relationship. For example, if you've uh, teamed up with somebody in your family against your partner uh, at some point, that may feel like a betrayal. That stands out to me already because for some people that is abusive, and I think often it is, I think it is because, you know, the way that I run my marriage, the way that it was mimicked to me or at least shown to me by my parents is like they are the team against everybody else. And it's not that, well, obviously the hope is that you're marrying a healthy person and the hope is that you're doing life together. And so there wouldn't be a reason for you to quote, betray your partner and talk to somebody else about your marriage. Now, if something bad is happening, if there is abuse occurring, obviously you want to talk to people about your marriage and that would erode the foundation of the marriage as it is. But I do think there are some people who forget that, you know, the sanctity of marriage, the sort of the dig dignity of the relationship should sort of have about like a boundary around what you tell other people about that marriage, especially if it's a healthy one. You know, I always like pay attention to how people talk about their husbands or wives or what they say about them. Or if they talk shit about them, I'm like, mm-hmm. And don't get me wrong. I used to talk shit on a lot of my partners while I was dating them because I thought, well, you know, we're grownups. And just because you're my partner doesn't mean I'm going to let you get away with shit, which is true. But see, I was dating toxic and unhealthy people. And I should have known that the fact that I could even talk shit on my partner was proof that I was in a bad relationship. And I was the one choosing to be there. Because ultimately, like you, when you're not, again, I wasn't being trapped. Nobody was holding me hostage. I just kept thinking, we'll grow out of this. We'll go to therapy. We'll get better. And then, pfft. so I was choosing to be in those toxic relationships and I was toxic enough to, to tolerate them, if I'm going to be honest. So again, now that I'm in a healthy marriage, now that I'm on the other side and I'm healthy, it would be a betrayal if my husband is going to somebody in our life and talking about our, like if we had problems, talking about it with somebody else and not me. Or even telling other people about me in some capacity that feels too intimate. Now, we've talked about this. It would be a betrayal for us to emotionally invest in someone else and in a way that was so intimate. It would be similar to how we invest in one another. I do not talk to my sister the same way I talk to my husband. I do not share the same thoughts and feelings and fears with any of my friends or siblings that I've ever shared with partners. This idea, like I am so transparent with my best friends. But still, I always kept a wall up. I still always had a boundary. So even if people felt in the past like, oh, Brittany, you know, Brittany used to tell me things, you know, um, I wasn't ever telling you everything. How could I? I'm not married to you. I'm not in love with you. But this illusion that like I tell my best friend everything, I think that's kind of a red flag. I feel like the only person you should tell everything to is probably your partner because they're the one doing literal life with you. But that's just my like belief around it. It would feel like a betrayal if he was telling his best friend everything. I feel like I get everything and the best friend gets some things. I also think there are parts of me that I can't explain to you unless I'm fucking you. So I feel like because we're monogamous, that would also be kind of a betrayal if, you know, he shared everything with his best friend because I mean, they fuck him. Uh, you know, and it doesn't have to be sexual, but it's something that needs to be healed. Because trust and commitment are so important as the bedrock of every relationship. If I was to say, tell me the exact, you know, in your love lab, two cup, a couple walk in and they, they're there for 24 hours in your love lab and you're studying them. Can you role play the behavior that a couple who are destined to fail Ooh. would exhibit? Oh, yes. yes. Ooh. How many ways can we do that? Okay. God, these... Crossword puzzles are really hard. Hmm. You know, I'm really sick and tired of you always paying attention to your stupid crossword puzzles. They're just, they're such a waste of time. I don't know why you do that. It's, it's just stupid. Yeah, well, I, I, I think they're too challenging for you intellectually. What? That's why you avoid them. What are you talking about? Yeah. I could do that with... Almost my yeah, eyes I never closed. see you do a crossword puzzle. Because it's stupid activity. Why would I want to do it? I think, I think you're avoiding it because you're avoiding challenges in your life. You do that in every phase of your life. 
avoid challenges. You always <laughs> take the easy road. You think that marrying you was the easy road? Are you kidding? <laughs> I've never heard my parents talk like this to each other. Never, ever, 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 ever have I ever heard my parents have even something similar to this conversation with one another. But, you know, I've had this conversation with exes. I've been that couple at the dinner table that makes it very awkward for all your friends because you're bickering at one another. And that's what I call a toxic relationship. I've never in all the years of watching my parents be married ever heard this kind of conversation come out of their faces. But I have been that couple. Not with my husband, but with my past relationships. Cringe. But obviously when I say like I used to be toxic, talk about uncomfortable. Picking a fight and bickering at your partner while you're at dinner and out with your friends. Jesus. I was so toxic in my 20s. And I'm so glad that I outgrew it. Okay, so that's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> I've seen that before. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> so have we. What's the opposite then? Using the crossword mm -hmm. example again, if you role play the, the opposite sure. scenario. Okay. Boy, some of these challenger crossword puzzles are really hard. Really? Yeah. Oh, did you find something really hard in the one you're doing now? Yeah, it's so like you have to know the names of these dinosaurs I've never heard of in oh. order to complete the puzzle. Oh my God, that sounds impossible. I know, yeah, it really does. Yikes. Yeah. What are you working on right now that's so hard? Well, I, you know, I'm trying to do these Sudoku things. Oh no, I'm really? having a lot of trouble with those. Oh, those are impossible <laughs> for me. Oh my God. Yeah. I like that you really love challenges. Good luck with that. I don't <laughs> think I'll be able to help you. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it kind of looks like that. And what, what are the like fundamental differences? Like is, is something being deposited in that first example that's going to be insidious and, and to result in the relationship falling down? Think of the word stupid. Mm -hmm. I used it three times. Put down, criticism, contemptuous. How does he respond? Counterattacks. You're not smart enough to do these. Mm -hmm. It's like the belittling. It ha holds no dignity for me. So I would say like this lacks dignity. Um, cause my partner and I, we do the crossword every night. We do the mini every night. We do connections. We do, uh, Wordle. We do like, we do all the puzzles. Okay. We do all the puzzles every night. It's a part of our nightly routine. It's like a thing we do. We're like an old couple. Okay. We love that. So we do these puzzles every night and we joke a lot. Like our relationship is like very fun and we poke at each other, but we also are constantly checking in with one another because our humor is so like, we're both very sharp and very funny. But even when he tells me I have Gordon Ramsay forehead, he always goes, oh my God, are you okay? Was that a lot? And I was like, <laughs> and it's like fun because he checks in and I check in. So even if we make a joke that's so mean, we're like, oh, fuck, that was good. Are you okay? It's like we're trying to say, even though we're smart enough to make a mean joke, I need you to know that I'm never actually trying to be mean to you. I just think I'm funny, you know? Which is kind of what we do on the internet sometimes. Like, oh, that was a mean joke. But in my defense, I'm just trying to be funny. And it, it kind of works when you have an audience that knows that versus an audience that doesn't know that about you. It doesn't matter if the audience is your mother, your friends, your partner, or your literal YouTube audience. I think if you know where the person is coming from, it says a lot. But genuinely, like, I try very hard not to go too hard on the audience in general because I don't want to do that, but sometimes I go very hard on the haters, don't I? Don't I call people dumb as fuck and then I block them all the time? I'm not trying to make a connection with them. I'm trying to sever the connection. You know what I mean? Um, Jasmine says, how do you feel about talking about your sex life with your friends? So I used to do it all the time. And... And we used to do it in great detail because like a lot of us were very open. My partner was very open at the time. With this marriage now, I will say we're a lot more private. And I will say that if I do talk about my sex life with like my sister, I use much more PG language. And I definitely uh, don't add in the details I used to add in during my casual years. And I think a lot of that is out of respect to my partner and same like it's not like he goes and talks about our sex life to his friends. Like we might talk about sex because we're all sex positive. Like all of his friends are very modern. We all have modern conversations. So we might as adults talk about sex, but there's a difference between talking about your sex life in detail 
and just talking about sex that is about your life to adult friends. So I'm not going to shy away from sex as a subject matter. And I'm willing to say things. I say things to you. But I would like not go into the exact detail that I used to when I was younger. Like I was watching Love is Blind and there was a scene, I was going to say Love on the Spectrum, but Love is Blind. And there was a conversation between the girls where they were all talking about the guys' dick size. And the one girl who walked away from the conversation and didn't want to have it with the girls, she's the only girl who got married in this season. The only couple that met, made it to the altar was the only couple that didn't talk about each other's sex life and was very private and was like, this isn't like for the public. Because of course these girls got to know they're being recorded. This is going on TV. You just talked about your husband's dick size on television. And the only girl who didn't do that is the only one who made it to the altar. And I think there's something about that. There's like a dignity to it. You know what I mean? Chrissy says, I feel like if you're going to talk to an outside source about the relationship, there's a way to do it without talking shit. Sometimes... If your partner is really good at convincing you you're the problem, it's good to get feedback. So that would be a toxic relationship. So there's a difference between if you're in a healthy relationship, yeah, guys, you don't talk about your relationship. If you're in a toxic relationship, you need to talk to your friends because something is wrong. You know what I mean? Something is wrong. There's a difference and knowing the difference is kind of key. When do you know when to talk to your friends? You remember that girl we watched, Who the Fuck Did I Marry? And I kept wondering, like, why isn't she telling anyone about this? And it's because she was in a toxic bubble that told her not to tell people about her marriage and the details of it. But in that case, she should have and needed to reach out to somebody. So how do you know when you're in that, that kind of relationship where you need to talk to somebody, you have the desire to talk to somebody? I think that's one of the key factors. I never have the desire to tell anyone about my relationship because, one, it's always good. Like, genuinely, there's... There's no problems in this marriage. So there's nothing to talk about. And so that's that's kind of the thing is if there's problems in your marriage, you should be talking to a therapist or reaching out to a friend if you're super, super concerned. And I think that's the difference. Do you know what I'm saying? I really think that instinct you have within you that's like, I really want to talk to my mom about this. That's probably a red flag that something's wrong, you know? In my opinion. Defensiveness. These are like personality attacks. And yeah. And straight from the exactly. jump. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And how does that lead to divorce? How does it feel mm. when somebody looks down on us, mm -hmm. is disgusted by us, does think we're stupid? It's like your parents. Oh, my God. You're so dumb. You know, your older sibling was always so much better than you. You know, even though you're my genetics, I'm kind of shocked because you're so, you know, you're so unsuccessful. It's like, wow, you really think your kid's going to see you in retirement? All these parents that are like, why don't my kids talk to me in retirement? Oh, I don't know. Did you belittle and talk bad to them and abuse them while they were growing up? And did you ever apologize or acknowledge that you were a shitty parent? It's like you can betray your kids in the same way, same energy, same category that you can betray your spouse. Somebody who trusts you and relies on you and loves you, right, To who looks at you and tears you down and belittles you, there's a difference between, hey, I really think you should do better out of love. I love you. And hey, like I'm going to belittle you so you feel bad about yourself. It's kind of the difference between somebody who's actually trying to help you out of love and someone who's just trying to do it out of their own ego, do we want to be close to that person? Mm -mm. Do we want to have sex with that person? Mm -mm. Do we trust that person? No, we do not. We pull away from them. It can be much more subtle as well than you demonstrated there. What are like sure. the subtlest ways that that contentment can show up in a, in a conversation? So you wouldn't, you know, I, I've asked you to do the dishes. You wouldn't really think of getting your hands wet to do the dishes, would you? So that's I really, sort of I really hate getting my hands wet. Okay, so that was a little bit of sarcastic. It was sarcastic, content. but getting your hands wet, I mean, it's, it's like, it's contempt again. What, would, what advice would you give to me then? I'm 31 years old. I'm four years into my relationship. You're, what, 36 years into your marriage? 37. 37 years into your marriage? Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to me to make sure that I get 37 years deep? <laughs> 
you know, you've given me lots of advice today about how to argue and how to resolve conflict. Get, get these, get this notebook. I'm going to get a notebook. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get, I'm going to carry around a notebook. And, and pen, the minute yeah. we have an argument, I'm going to start taking notes. Yeah. That's my solution. You know, and do you, do you know hmm. her dreams? This is a really good question because I think I know her dreams, but I've never really asked directly. Oh. Bro, don't you? Th I love that honesty because I see that this is the problem I see in so many couples is like, I think I know her dreams, but I've never asked her directly. My partner and I, when I say that like we are fully transparent, I mean like we neurodivergently share every intrusive thought we have out loud. We'll just talk. We'll be like, blah, 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 blah. It's like we're playing video games and all of a sudden it's like, blah, 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 da, 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 da. Like you just share. You just constantly just talking, 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 talking. We talk all the time. But we also want to know. I'm like, what is this? What do you want to do with your life? Now we're two different people. My partner and I are two different people. And yes, as a team, we're doing the same, like we're going for the same goals, but as individuals, we have different goals that we're focusing on making sure coincides with the team goal. So team goal first, then individual goals. And that's how we're running our relationships in the past. I used to do individual goals, then team goals. Never worked for me personally. Oh. Which I probably should have according to Julie's yeah, eyes. Yeah, you might be surprised by the answer. Yes, sir. And I think sometimes people are afraid to ask because they're afraid that it will end the relationship, which it might, which I think you should, you know. Does she know yours and why they're so important to you beyond just, yeah, it's fascinating. I'm not even sure I know mine. <laughs> Which yeah. is a bit of an issue. And how is wonderful. How is it? Introspection. Introspection is that answer. Why do I want the things I want? Why am I famous? Why am I worth money? Stephen is a very successful person. The diary of the CEO, the host, he's a very successful person. Why? Why did he even do it in the first place? Relate to you being from Botswana. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing because I think sometimes we're scared of voicing our dreams because we think it might result in figuring out that they're unaligned. Mm -hmm. Like, I think if I asked her mm -hmm. what her dreams were, she's, she's very ambitious. She wants to start a family. I think she wants to live in the, the sun somewhere. Mm -hmm. My dreams are probably more focused on, I want to start a family too, but I want to, I love doing this podcast. And there's only a couple of cities in the world where I can do it. Mm. Um, and there's only one city in the world where I think I can do this podcast and it's sunny and that's here. Mm. Ah. And she might not like being here, but for a variety of reasons. So it's like... And then you, when you have kids, you realize that you can't just fly around like I do now. I have to, we have to be together and present and raise the kids. So I don't know, in my head, I've just thought, cross that bridge when we come to it. Is that a good way to deal with life? No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, it's not a bad way. It's not a bad way. You know, it, it depends on uh, your timing. Uh, but the book we wrote, Eight Dates, uh, which gives you conversations to have that are really, really important mm -hmm. as you are establishing a long-term relationship or if you're already in one but you haven't had conversations like these in a while, then those are great to have. And you don't have to be afraid, you know, mm -hmm. that your dreams are very different from one another because it's interesting too because um i think the subject matter of job comes up a lot like if your job is really unique and it is amazing what people are willing to do like what they're willing to prioritize and i do think people that prioritize work but are married or have kids or anything like that they forget how to have the balance with those two and studies have shown time and time and time again especially if you're worried about little boys growing up without fathers that most of the children that report having very busy and successful fathers would have preferred them at home, right? I married, uh, I married, I'm, my dad's very entrepreneurial. He has his own, own business, been successful almost 30 years. You know what I mean? Yeah, almost 30 years now. And he always prioritized every evening with the family. On occasion, he missed dinner very rarely and every Sunday with the kids. And he cooked for us every weekend. Saturday and Sundays were his breakfast days, his his dinner days, like that's what he loved to do, you know, to be a participant in our life. And it went a hugely long way for us. I was just reminiscing with my older brother um, about this, like how everyone is so independent. All mom and dad's kids are like fiercely different, but we all have like a very solid foundation. 
and we all love being home. We all love like basically how we were raised, give or take a couple of things, of course. But more than anything, if we really looked at our parents' marriage, it was a good one. Even if their parenting was imperfect, their marriage was basically perfect. Like there's really like maybe a, I couldn't even think of very many things that needed to be su significantly changed in their relationship. Like I, I, I think the only thing is I wish my dad traveled more so my mom could travel more because my mom prefers to travel with my dad. You know what I mean? Like she would come to Europe more likely if my dad would come with her. But getting my dad out of the house is like <laughs> my dad's a homebody like me. Funny enough, I'm so much like my dad. But the irony is. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of fun. Maybe that's the only thing, um, which I don't think will be that big of a deal moving forward. But anyways, there's not much. But they always prioritized my dad's business because that was the income and how to raise the kids. And that's kind of interesting. They didn't prioritize uh, anything sort of at a sacrifice of another, just sort of it made sense for the team. And I think about that, too, with my marriage. I don't want us to feel like regretful. I want us to feel like everything makes sense and it is the better decision and we're really happy we made the better decision. And I think that's why we go with full transparency and honesty so we don't have to wake up one day and be like, who did I marry? So I don't have to wake up one day and have a midlife crisis because if I'm transparent the whole way through, then there is going to be no surprises. Versus with Steven in this interview, he's not sure of his wife's or his girlfriend's, his partner's. He's not sure of his partner's dreams. And maybe there is a fear that maybe they'll want different things and then they'll have to break up. But wouldn't you rather know that as it's happening versus waking up one day and being like, oh, my God. Oh, no. You know what I mean? If there's a lot of love, you know, with maybe a couple of exceptions out there, you can figure out a way to make it work. What advice would you give to me then? I want all of the advice that you haven't yet given me today. Okay, so one of them would be just remember that 85% turning towards figure. Okay. Turn towards her as much as you can. You don't mean physically, you mean... No. Yeah. I mean, if she makes a little bid for connection, like, hey, Stephen, um, come into the kitchen. I want to show you something. Get up and go to the kitchen. 85% of the time at least. Try. Okay. Do your best. It's not going to be perfect. It's 86%, by the way. Oh, <laughs> honey. Like every morning, if my partner wakes up before me, he has a routine he does. But usually if he, if I'm awake and I'm in bed and he gets up out of the kitchen and he makes a walk towards or past the bedroom, I will reach my arms out and make a bid for affection. And I'll say like, oh. Hug me good morning, kiss me good morning. And if he didn't want to do that every morning, if he was like, oh, I don't want to kiss you this morning. Like, I have to go to my office. Or if he was like, no, I'd be like, oh. But instead, every morning or whenever it happens, if he wakes up before me, he opens the door, says good morning. Usually Indiana Jones is in the bed and he goes, here are my girls or something like that, something affectionate. And then he'll hug and kiss me. And we'll spend about 15 to 20 seconds just holding each other. And that's how I get to start off my morning with a deep, loud, physical reassurance that we woke up happy today and everything's great. Which for a person who, you know, even though I'm on the other side of my abandonment issues, even though I'm on the other side of my borderline, even though my borderline's in remission for years, deep down there's still like a little girl in there that's wondering like, am I going to be abandoned? And so it's nice to have those physical sense, like senses. Re I'm reassured through my senses. I get to smell him. I get to touch him. I get to like, you know what I mean? And then Indiana gets her reassurance. And then we all just go about our day, right? He leaves. I get up. I brush my teeth. I like start my day. And then when I'm done making my coffee, I head to my office and I do it again. I go to his office and I kiss him hello. And I go for a phys, you know, but we're doing it because we love each other and we when we pass by each other's doors, we're always screaming, I love you, because that's just who we are. One, we're super like gushy, gushy like that. But two, we don't shame ourselves for wanting to be sort of needy or show affection. I think there's a lot of shame of sort of like you're being silly, you're being like teenagers, but like, yes, like we're being in love. I'm never going to take for granted anytime I get to hear I love you. But I think sometimes people take it for granted. Even my mom or dad growing up, 
Like if somebody said I love you, you have to say it back. Not because um you're being forced to, but because it's like a bid for attention or affection even from your like siblings. Like if I was like I love you mom and she was like uh-huh, I'd be like what the fuck? <laughs> Did my mom just reject my love? Like, that would be so weird. Can you imagine your kid coming to you and being like, I love you, mom. And she's just like, and that happens. Children will go up, five-year-old children will go up to their parents and say, I love you. And the parents go, uh-huh. That's not good. <laughs> See, he's my numbers man. I can always count on him to... Come up with the right. Okay, so you got to work even harder, Stephen. Okay. Eighty-six percent of the time. Yeah. So that's a good one. Another one is when you are talking about an issue, work really hard to not blame and not criticize. Don't I always tell you guys? I don't blame. I don't point fault. Nobody's blamed. Nobody's at fault. We are only problem solving and observing. Yep. Describe yourself. Mm -hmm. your own feelings, what situation you're upset about, and what your positive need is, not the negative. I learned this from my last relationships because I would blame and point fault, and I'd forget to look inward and say, how have I contributed? So when I say, like, it takes two to be in a toxic relationship, I'm saying hold yourself accountable and see if your partner will do the same because that tells you a lot more than you just blaming them and blaming them. See if they even can hold themselves accountable because their values will be clear to you if they can't. Negative one. Anything else, John? We have this great card deck called Expressing Your Needs. I don't know if, if you've got a copy of that one. No, I've got, no, uh, I've got, no, no. You can download it on the, on the app store, Gottman Card Decks. Have it on your phone. And once a week, just sit down with her and go through and say, okay, here's, here's two things I need this week. Why? Why should I do that? Because then it's real clear, you know, and... Wait, I missed that. I'm on card decks. Have it on your phone. And once a week, just sit down with her and go through and say, okay, here's, here's two things I need this week. Why? Why should I do that? Because then it's real clear, you know, and she can tell you what two things you, you can do to make her happy. Oh, we just do this daily, like four times a day. <laughs> My partner and I, we just check in every day, all day. That's all we do. You know what I mean? We just check in all day. How are you doing? Do you need anything from me? I love you. Do you need anything from me? Today I did calls and stuff. Um, and uh, before I started my calls, he's like, hey, I'm going to the store. What do you need? Hey, I'm doing this. What do you need? We just check in every day. Like, what do you need? It's like kind of like, again, we're on a team. So I was like, what do you need today? What does the team need today to be successful? And then I asked him, hey, what do you need today from me? What can I do for you? What does the schedule look like? What do you think our day is going to look like? You know what I mean? And then we just kind of go through it. The, this week. And, you know, rather than leaving it to chance, you know. You're a man that loves maths. Which I can't tell if this is just the neurodivergent in my brain, but I love knowing. I hate guessing. Those relationships, those friendships I have, oh my God, they trigger the fuck out of me. The people in my life that are like, can you read my mind? No, no, no. Every relationship person I listen to that I think or every relationship I see that feels healthy to me has zero guessing games. And that's why I look at some people and I say, you're in a toxic fucking relationship because you play a lot of fucking guessing games. And when you all get it wrong and there's cheating and lying and all these awful things, you like don't even understand. It's because you're creating an ecosystem an environment that can't help but produce this toxicity. Don't make your partners guess. Don't make your friends guess. If your feelings are hurt, say, hey, my feelings are hurt. Can we talk about it? Don't force people to read your fucking mind. Whether it's your parents or your friends or your ch it drives me up the wall crazy. Absolutely refuse to engage. Absolutely fucking -lutely not. It's so cruel to torture people in this way, but you know they can't help it. It's their own toxicity. It's the own, only way they were ever probably taught love. They probably had to guess. They probably had no one who was like, can you just tell me? It's safe. You can just tell me. I love you. Just tell me. Because people are punished for being honest. Tell me how you feel and let's see if we can come to an agreement. Tell me you're hurt. 
Because if I don't know you're hurt, I'm not going to think about it. And I think that's because of the way they were raised. I think it's the way they were taught to sort of like need love and affection, but they don't know or don't feel good enough to ask for it. So they're hoping somebody will notice they're sad. They're hoping someone will notice um, that they need love and affection. And then when people don't notice, they're like, you're being a bad friend. You're being a bad partner. Not everyone is your like, not everyone is like your childhood trauma, bro. Some people just don't think to read your mind. Kay says all of those quote neurodivergent behaviors just sound like logical actions you take to reduce the probability of miscommunication, accidental harm. How autistic of you, Kay. <laughs> like, yeah. Sometimes I think, I do think that's sort of like efficient, logical, kind of like problem solving thinking. The thing that reduces pain is almost sort of like comes naturally more to neurodivergent people because that sort of like organizational thinking sort of allows for that to occur. John says, Britt, how do you deal with the situation where you believe that your partner is doing a task wrong but refuse to listen because both of you have the correct solution? It depends on what you mean by that. I feel like if you and your partner are arguing about getting something done and it's solution oriented, you're not being on the same team because it's about the team winning. So it doesn't matter who has the right solution. What matters is it's the right solution for the team to win. So I'm a little confused on what that could look like. Because ultimately there's only going to be a solution. And the idea is like, which one do we try or which one is correct? If we don't know which one is correct, we try the one, we try until we get the right one. If there is a solution that's obviously correct, you do that one, regardless of who came up with it. If your partner is doing something wrong, then you like you would first have to have the fundamental like the foundational belief and trust that your partner would never steer you wrong and i think that's really difficult i believe i am in a marriage in which my partner would never purposely or mal maliciously steer me wrong and vice versa we 100% trust each other so if somebody said like hey you're doing that wrong we'd be like oh my god am i doing it wrong tell me how to do it right and then I'd say, no, actually, now that you've explained yourself, I actually don't think you're correct. I think this is correct. And then we would sit there and problem solve it until we agreed. But it wouldn't be about you're doing it wrong. It would be about, hey, I love you. I think you're doing that wrong. And it's like, oh, shit, am I doing it wrong? You would like trust that person to point it out. But obviously, it, it would be okay to also disagree on what you think is wrong, depending on how you do it. You know? Chrissy says, hell yes, it should never be about mind reading. It's such a bad habit that people from my bubble have. It's super frustrating, bro. And then they build up this whole narrative in their head that you're uncaring or unempathetic or you're like so narcissistic because you're not thinking about them. Bro, I ain't gonna read no one's mind, bro. It's crazy. But I think, and my theory is, they probably grew up in an environment where it probably was narcissistic for the people around them or maybe the people around them made them earn love in a very like cruel way. And so they think that if it happens again, that it's somehow a relationship to that trauma. But you know, what do I know? Um, <clears throat> Kay says your convo with thought spot had me wondering about ADHD more because y'all were just repeating my personal observations and thought processes, bro. Talking to Irene, if you guys haven't seen that podcast, was so good. And I love, we've talked a few times in private and those conversations have been some of the most stimulating conversations I've had in so long. Her brain and my brain, we get along so well. Like so well, which is why I'm like, okay, like I'm a neurodivergent queen. There ain't no way. Like I get along with her so well. It's really nice, you know? Kay says of the whole process of getting diagnosis, diagnosed with and so emoji, my life was much more negative and my life was much more negatively impacted. I definitely look into it for sure. It's difficult when you're, you know, your low support needs. And so you're like, should I do it? But dude, when I say I want to be 10% more efficient, I'm telling you, I think a diagnosis would help me with that. But at the same time, I want to make sure it's the right one. Right. Yes. Give me some of the most interesting things mathematical conclusions you've been able to arrive at through your work through the love lab i think the most amazing one is that the only way to be powerful in a relationship is to accept influence Ooh, ooh. And, uh, 
on a relation is that the only way to be powerful in a relationship is to accept influence. Didn't we just say that? Who was that, John? Didn't we just say that? I think he's talking about what you just asked, right? About the couples. If you notice your partner's doing something wrong, you have to be open to their influence. I think that's what he's about to say. Because that's, I think that's what I mean. It's like you have to be open in a way that you're not open to other people. You know what I mean? Because you trust the person you have chosen. I trust myself. You know what I mean? And it's so counterintuitive. But that turns out to be really powerful. That I, I found that very surprising. The only way to be powerful is basically to... Be influenceable. Be flexible. Be movable. Mm. Listen to your partner mm. and try to accept some influence from what they're saying. Not, not perfectly, of course. Anything else? Say what you need. Say what you need. Friends, family, partners, no mind reading games. Say what you need. Just tell people. But you know, there's this romantical, magical thing that happens. I'm not going to call anybody out, but man, some of y'all astrology signs, so dramatic. It's like they love the romanticism and the sensationalism. They love the idea of somebody reading their mind and like not even having to say it. You just know me so well. I didn't even have to tell you. You just read my mind. And I'm like, that's sweet. But I also think that's a foundation for a very toxic relationship with the self and with the people around you. And then to project that desire and need onto other people is so fucked up. Say what you need. Otherwise, honestly, I don't care what you need. If you can't say what you need, I don't care. Don't expect your partner to read your mind because they exactly. never can. Mm, a fucking men or your friends, bitch, or your friends. Mm. Anything else? Yep, one more. This is one of our favorite questions. Ask your partner once a week, mm. what is something I can do next week to make you feel more loved? We have. Oh, we just check in with each other and do that every day, girl. We mm. have this annual honeymoon that we do, uh, that we've done for 23 years. And we go away and bring our kayak and we ask each other three questions over two weeks. What sucked about this year? <laughs> what did you like about this year? And what do you want next year to be like? So we have that once a year time when we can really take a hard look at our lives mm. and see what needs to change. Here's the deal. We're talking to each other all the time mm -hmm. because we work together. Mm. And we're expressing love and affection and gratitude to one another all the time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of- Same, 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 same. Of our work is- And it's genuine. I think that's the key is I, same. It's, you know, it's easy to fucking gush about your partner when you fucking love them and they're wonderful. I literally will have like friends, family, people in my life who will tell me about their relationships and the only stories they tell me about them are horrible, horrible stories. Cheating, lying, financial fraud, all this stuff. And then they'll be like, why do you hate my relationship? Why don't you think it's healthy? And I'm like, um, and then versus, and I think this goes back to saying, when do you talk about your relationships, right? Is when you think there's a problem, but when you don't have problems and you're just in love and everything is going wonderful because the communication is so good, it's easy to gush to your partner every day and be like, I love you. Thank you so much. Oh my God. Thank you so much for doing this for me because genuinely you make my life easier. Thank you for making our life easier. And I think that's what it means to be on a team is you make the team win. You're thinking about, okay, the team, then yourself. But I think when you're young or when you're traumatized, you tend to make the relationship like secondary to you. And so you're willing to sacrifice the relationship anytime you feel threatened or anytime your trauma comes up or anytime you, you know what I mean? I think that's probably, there's some correlation causation there. Maybe. You know. Fun. Mm -hmm. It would be great mm. if we went out on more dates. The pandemic mm -hmm. kind of interfered with that mm -hmm. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but we loved it. But we loved it. 
And we love going on dates. It's just we're so darn busy, like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And we're really old, Stephen, so we're getting tired. <laughs> John, what does Julie mean to you? What does she mean to oh, me? What a question. Wow. She's really the most important thing in my life. <laughs> Absolutely the most important thing. Waking up in the morning and having her be next to me <laughs> is such a joy. And cuddling with her and our dog is just wonderful thing every morning <laughs> and and now we get to be grandparents together we have this two-year-old little boy that we're both in love with mm. oh. <laughs> and we get to see our daughter be a mom you know it's it's the greatest gift that anybody's ever given me is to become a father oh she means everything to me if she wasn't in your life what would you be missing everything Everything. Julie, what does John mean to you? <laughs> Bryson says this is what Waymond wanted in um, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I really love love. I really love love. Oh. 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 He's the most adorable, wonderful, lovable person I've ever had in my life. What he means to me is that he has healed me from a lot of my own past trauma. He makes me laugh all the time. And I didn't know how to laugh at all. Mm -hmm. I never laughed before I met him. He supports my dreams. Nobody ever cared about my dreams knew about my dreams before I met him, including crazy dreams. Okay, hold on. Does her necklace literally match his shirt? She's wearing like a blue, I think it's like a Star of David. She's wearing a blue necklace that matches his literal color matching. How cute is that? It's like going to Antarctica by myself. He supported that. Isn't that amazing? He is the most supportive, wonderful man. And the other thing is that- The way he's just looking at her, bro. He's so <laughs> damn smart. I knew I would never be bored. And he oh. reads a million times as much as- Bunny says, I'm gonna text my husband and profess my love for the third time today after this. Do it, do it. Literally, that's something else I give my per myself permission to do. I give myself permission to tell my husband I love him any moment I feel like saying it. And I never question if I'm saying it too much. And we give ourselves the permission because a lot of people are like, you're so needy. Oh, my God. She's saying I love you all day. Oh, my God. Like, no, I, I could hear it a thousand times a day. You could touch me all day and it will never be enough because like it will never I will never not feel so like <gasps> like, oh, my gosh. Like that is one thing we give each other permission to do is like it is never too much to say I love you a thousand times a day. It's never too much to kiss me too many times a day. It is never too much. It is never too much. But not because we're so deeply insecure we need the reassurance, but because we're so happy and joyful and we feel it so we show it. We are so happy and so in love and so joyful that we do it because we just need them to know that's how I feel right now. I think in some relationships, right, in some relationships like Chelsea and Jimmy on Love is Blind. She's like, you didn't kiss me enough time today. You didn't even kiss me at all today. She's making a plea because she feels insecure. I need you to kiss me more so I don't feel doubtful about this relationship. That's like punishing your relate. That's like punishing your partner. Instead, Chelsea should say, I really want to kiss you right now. So she kisses him because she wants to. But see how she wants Jimmy to kiss her to reassure her that the relationship is real? Spoiler, they don't make it to the altar. I don't kiss my partner to reassure myself. I kiss my partner because I fucking want to, sh I feel like it. I want to hold him and grab him and just love him because it's how I feel. I love him. As I do. I mean, I read a lot, but he reads so much that I'm constantly learning from him. So he's a source of knowledge, source of laughter, source of sunshine, source of a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous daughter. 
and mm. son-in-law and grandson. And he's got the most beautiful eyes in the whole wide world. That's what he means to me. Besides that, I love his hat. He always wears the same hat, and he has for like 40 years, because it makes him look like a Jewish intellectual Bolshevik. What could be better? <laughs> She's talking about my leather hat. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> Fisherman's Fight. hat. Fight right. The book has come out, I think, February 1st? I'm January 30th, yeah. Ah, yeah. okay. Why did you write this book? Why was it so important? There's so many things that you could have written about from all of your research, but for some reason, you wrote a book called Fight Right. Why did, why? Take a look at the world. Fighting, especially in the United States, has become more polarized than ever. Hmm. Secondly, hatred has become sanctioned as a, a fine way to express your own political points of view. Has there been any listening to each other? Zip. Mm. None. And so, you know, we can't, we're not politicians. We're not going to affect the whole social system. Mm. But if we can change how people listen to one another and love one another at home, which is what we know the most about, then we can hope and pray for a ripple effect to move out into society and create more love out in the world, too, where we need it so much. Making peace one family at a time. Oh, I love it. Nice mm. one. We have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last guest leaves a question for the next guest, not knowing who they're leaving it for. I'm going to ask you both to answer the question. Ooh, okay. I didn't get to see it until I open the book. Here we go. Oh, interesting. So I'm going to start this with Julie. Um, if you could go back and tell your parents any one thing at the time you were born, what would it be? If you could go back in time and tell your parents one thing at the time you were born. So 1989, May 14th, hospital, 14 hours of labor. If I could go back and tell them anything... Hmm. I want to say something stupid like, uh, you know, naming me Brittany was a risk, but a uh, good choice, <laughs> you know, because it was a risk, you know. Um, I could go back in time and say, like, this will be your hardest but most rewarding child. <laughs> I would tell my father. Star says I would tell them to break up. <laughs> you know what, base? Huh? Uh. Would you please stay home mm. at least one day a week? Damn. Instead of abandoning my mother every single day, seven days a week. I would tell my mother, stop being critical. Stop being contemptu contemptuous. Try to look for what all of us are doing right and say that rather than only pointing out what we're doing wrong. Why wasn't he home? He was a cardiologist. So oh. he was constantly gone saving lives, basically, uh, as a cardiologist. And when he wasn't, he was playing golf. Classic Ooh. cardiologist. And I think my mother may have drove him a little crazy because she was a very, very disturbed individual. Mm -mm -mm. So he escaped. And he was a 50s, 1950s father, right? Yeah. Which meant all he had to do was provide. That was it. No role with the children. And your mother, I'm guessing, didn't know how to fight in the way that you describe it in this book? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, my, my mother had witnessed horrible violence and rape Oof. within her home. Oof. She was incested herself Oof. in her own home growing up as a child. She mm -hmm. didn't feel like she had any value 
other than her beauty, and she was very, very beautiful. So she didn't feel entitled to ask for what she needed, and you need to feel at least some of that in order to fight for what you want and what you mm. need. And John? Same question? Yeah. What would I tell my parents? Yeah. I, I think that I would tell my parents, first of all, how much I love and appreciate them for who they were. And I don't think I did that enough, mm. um, especially with my dad. And I would also tell my parents to be better parents toward my sister because hmm. we really lived in two different families. And my sister didn't have an easygoing temperament. And, uh, and she was extremely talented musically. Mm. And I wish they had supported her music and loved her better because she really needed it. And I think they could have done a much better job being parents of her. They mm. did a great job with me. What was the cost to your sister? I think she felt really unloved. Hmm. Still does. Wow. Especially by my mom. Wow. And I felt very loved by my mom. Damn. I think that's kind of served to make sense of why you both do what you, you do in many respects. You both have an origin story, which is sort of pertinent and present in the work that you do in the perspectives you both take on the subject matter of love and relationships comes from two very different places and yeah um okay i'm gonna pause it there because that's the end of the podcast but what would i really tell my parents if i could go back it almost feels like you want to warn them <sighs> it's hard to say because if i'm going to be honest with my parents First of all, they're Middle Eastern and very stubborn. So even if I went back in time and was like, woo, I'm your daughter from the future, <laughs> you know, I would, um, I think the only thing that my parents could have significantly changed that I think would have impacted every single kid for the better across the board. And I think that's what I would want to do because they had 10 kids. So I think I would have done... I think I would want to advise them to do something that would benefit all of us, not just me, because I'm a, we're all very specific. So even picking a sibling is just, we're too specific. But I think universally, uh, hitting the kids, corporal punishment should have stopped uh, and should never probably have been there in general. But breaking generational curses takes a while. So they stopped hitting the kids when I was about 15. I think if they never hit us, it would have been better. And I think I would have told them it feels like teasing, but sometimes you're just bullying your children. And I think that would have significantly changed the trajectory for all of my siblings. I think all of my siblings ended up for the most part okay. I think we all have burdens of some that are the results of those two things, I think, across the board. I think all of us have some probable connection, except maybe the very youngest. Maybe. The very youngest probably had the most significantly different parents than the rest of us. The older kids had a different parent than the middle kids and the younger kids, but the youngest child, my baby bro, I will say, probably had the best and easiest upbringing. Um, but I will say, yeah, if they never hit us and if they never bullied us because they thought they were just teasing I'm thinking we probably would have been better off you know what I mean uh but I know they didn't mean it I know they thought they were doing the right thing but it's interesting to see how my little bro came out because he got he basically I don't even know if he has a memory of any of those things because my parents remember like I had my my parents had me at 30 Right. So my parents were a few years older than I am now dealing with middle schoolers and high schoolers. And by the time my baby bro came along, my mom was in her 40s. My dad was in 40. And by the time he graduated high school, they were in their 60s. 
when I graduated graduated high school, my parents were still 45, 50? Is that right? Am I doing math right? Yeah. Ish. Completely different people, you know? Not to mention my oldest brothers, who are five to six years older than me, had even younger parents, very different parents, you know? But yeah, I think those two things could have significantly shifted a lot of the relationships we had with ourselves and other people. And at the same time, it certainly wasn't like CPS worthy or anything like that. But it was enough to make an indent, enough to internalize it, I think, as kids growing up, you know? But I think that would, yeah, I think that's probably, I'd say something to that effect, maybe. You know? Yeah. Jay Anthony in the chat says, I came for the awesome head of curly hair and staying for the interesting conversation about parenting and its effects. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to see, like, those, again, talking about romantic relationships, but also parenting. Even the way you treat your spouse absolutely impacts your child's understanding of their own future and what they should expect from the people around them. If you grow up in a bubble where you think all men are cheaters and abusers, what message is that going to send to your children? What message, what understanding, what tool are they gathering at such a young age? And then what cycle are they going to repeat? You know? It's so interesting. That's why I look at people and I say you can almost predict where the kid is going to end up just based off of the lessons they'll learn from their parents. Now, if the kid is lucky, the kid will be introspective and choose a different path. If the kid is lucky, they will do something possibly opposite of what their parents did. Who was it? What TV show? What movie? You hear it often where bad parents will say, you know, you became successful because of the the way I raised you. And the kid, I remember it being a male figure, would say, I became successful in spite of you. I think parents often think, If the child ends up good, it means they were good parents. Or if the child ends up bad, it means it was somebody else's problem. The child's going to end up how they end up based off their own trajectory. But so much of it comes from the foundation of the parents. August says, I'm curious what would have happened if my mom forgave my dad and decided to grow into um, and teach her child how awful he was 20 years Wait, when that's not even my reality? You mean your mom taught you like your dad was horrible growing up, but that wasn't your reality? That's always interesting too is watching parents who talk bad about each other to their children. Is that what you mean? I don't want to take you out of context, you know? Because I think about that too. My parents never talked bad about each other to me. You know, even if they had disagreements and say, I don't agree with your mother here. I don't agree with your father here, but we'll compromise. They taught us how to problem solve a lot growing up. So I would say my parents' relationship was better than even their skill as a parent, which makes sense. Parenting is a completely different skill, right? Bunny says I had to go through a lot of therapy because I kept finding men that were abusive and cheater and toxic and I realized something must be wrong with my processing if I keep ending up there. That's very introspective of you. That is very introspective of you. Took till I was 27 to figure that out. I was literally, that is very introspective of you. My late 30s significantly changed the trajectory of my life when I realized like, why do I keep ending up in toxic relationships? That was a huge, questionable, confusing thing for me because my parents weren't in a toxic relationship. So I'm a kid who ended up in toxic relationships and her parents weren't even in a toxic relationship. So why did I end up in a toxic relationship even though my parents have a healthy marriage? A part of it was that for a time in my life, I didn't trust my parents because they were so awful when it came to LGBT issues, because they lied to me as a kid growing up, because they were afraid I would end up the way I ended up, ironically enough, like in terms of bad relationships. I kept trying to figure it out on my own. For five years of my life, I didn't really talk to my family. I was like estranged from them. And it was during those five years that I got in my most toxic relationships. My most toxic relationships were started and had during the five years I wasn't talking to my family. And that absolutely changed my life. 
And then when I started incorporating my life back into my family's life, it was easier to have them say like, don't date these people, they're toxic. But then I didn't understand why they thought they were toxic because I kept thinking, well, you know, we're young. So maybe if we get the right therapy, we'll be better. Or maybe the potentiality will be better. But my parents didn't exactly have the skill to explain to me why I was dating toxic people. So I had to figure it out on my own. And fundamentally, I realized I was toxic enough to tolerate bad behavior. It's amazing what you'll tolerate in the hopes of love. It's amazing what you'll tolerate in the hopes that people will be their future potential. Like it's kind of amazing how you'll trick your brain into thinking, if I just try this, it will be better. But then you forget it's not just your partner's job to fix themselves. It's your job to fix yourself. I remember telling one of my toxic partners, hey, I would like a partner that does X, Y, Z. And they were like, well, I could do that for you. And I was like, no, I don't want you to do it for me. I want you to be the person who's already doing it. So I know I'm dating that kind of person. But see, I came from a world. No, I, I ended up in a world in my 20s where everybody was changing who they were to fit their relationships instead of picking relationships that reflected who they already were. And it's really difficult to realize you're doing it. And I think it comes from a hope of like we're connecting so much in this regard will make everything else work. So when I went single for three years, not on purpose, I was still dating. I just wasn't, I didn't go out, you know, past a couple of dates with people. But once I was like in the courting state of my life, stage of my life, and I was like picking and trying to find a spouse, you know, and I was dating boys and girls and all these people and I was trying to figure it out. Basically, nobody stayed in my life very long if there wasn't a true connection in terms of values and then the va-va-voom, of course. So if I wasn't physically attracted to you, you're out. And if our values didn't align, we're out. But I didn't know my values until my late 20s, 30. 30 was a huge significant change for my life. And when you don't know your values, it's like, how do I even know who to pick to date? How would I even know what I want for my life if I don't even know what I'm willing to tolerate? I didn't know my values so much so that I allowed people to literally use and abuse me. And I just, I kept thinking, well, that's their life. It's not mine. And that's their decisions. And that's their values. But what does this have to do with me? And everything if I stay in that relationship. And nothing if I leave it. In my head, in real life while I'm dead, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking, yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Then